Hi, and welcome back to Unlock Your Bible, the show where the Bible is taught in a plain and clear way for all to understand. I'm your Bible teacher, Ron Knight, and I ask that you get your King James Bible, a pen and a piece of paper to take notes, and join us in our study, at the book of Gal in our study for the book of Galatians. You know, my friend, I always start off the program by asking, are you tired of the religious system? Are you tired of being on the treadmill of religion? I call it, you know what a treadmill is? You can run as hard as you want, but you're still going nowhere fast, aren't you? Well, that's what religion will do. The word religion, re, re, religion, re to bind up again, legio, it, it means to bind back, okay? It's a man binding himself back to God. Re, legio. When, when we talk about religion, when I mention religion, it's a man's attempt to bind himself back to God. God only gave one religion in the scriptures, and that was his religion called the law of Moses to the one nation, the nation of Israel, in time past. My friend, for the past 2,000 years, God has not, ha has not been operating a religion. God has been operating a program of faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul is in your, in your Bible. My friend, in the books of Genesis through Acts, in a Bible, as Paul says, to rightly divide it, and it's broken up in three, three parts, time past, but now in the ages to come. The Bible is broken down to past, present, and future. The books of Genesis through Acts speak through Moses and the prophets. It's law, it's the law program or prophecy, the Bible calls it, speaking to one nation, the nation of Israel, and any Gentiles or other nations God would deal with through this nation. This goal of prophecy has to do with an earthly kingdom that God has promised that he would set up through that nation. But in Acts chapter 9, God changed the program because of Israel's unbelief. They crucified their Messiah. They stoned a man named Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And in Acts chapter 9, the chief of sinners, Saul of Tarsus, became the Apostle Paul when he trusted the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. The Lord appeared to him in a vision, and he made him the Apostle Paul. And the 13 letters of the Apostle Paul, what Paul calls but now, speak of the cross of Christ. It has to do with the present. It's our Apostle Paul, his 13 books, Romans through Philemon, our doctrine for today. It's the grace message called the mystery of Christ. Israel had Christ according to prophecy. Now, the word prophecy means that which was spoken by the mouth of all God's holy prophets to Israel since the world began. Paul's preaching of Jesus Christ, Romans 16, 25, has to do with the revelation of the mystery, which God kept secret in himself since before the world began and now made manifest through the preaching of the Apostle Paul. It's to the Gentiles, which is every man, the nations. No longer is God dealing with mankind through a nation of Israel. Now each individual Israelite, each individual Gentile, every man, can trust the cross work of Christ. You know, if you're out there, you're a Jewish person or a Gentile, you need to believe Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins in order to be pleasing to God. This has to do with God's heavenly kingdom, the body of Christ was created to rule and reign in the heavens with God. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. You ever notice he didn't say just the universe? Because God has a program, a plan for the heaven and the earth. Here, God is going to, he's building a body of believers called the body of Christ, a term only found in Paul's epistles to reconcile the heavenly places. A fallen government, a fallen kingdom under Satan's control. That's our job. When a man who believes Christ died for his sins, since the Apostle Paul, when they die, they go to be with the Lord in heaven. One day God is going to finish this dispensation of grace with the event called the rapture or the resurrection, the catching away of the body of Christ. And then he's going to deal with believing Israel again. He's going to pour out his wrath. And that's what the books of Hebrews through Revelation says. The world, the way it is now, my friend, will not continue. Did you know that? Don't let your heart... Be, be afraid about the things that's going on, because if you're in Christ, the only hope, by the way, you have is the Lord Jesus Christ. He, Paul calls him the hope of glory. Christ in us Gentiles. So to be spared from God's wrath, you need to be in his son. And the way you get in his son, Paul says, is to believe he died on the cross to pay for your sins, was buried and rose again. When you trust Christ, Romans 5 says he delivered us from the wrath to come. Well, one day God, in the books of Hebrews through Revelation, said he's going to pour out his wrath. And he's going to save believing Israel, Those, that little flock of remnant, that little remnant, that little flock who believe Christ is their Messiah. That's your Bible. 
Now, if you're not learning the Bible this way, you don't understand it. And the only way you can understand it, past, present, future, is by doing what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15 in your King James Bible, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I said all of that because in the book of Galatians, Paul, our apostle, explains the difference between God's law program and grace. See, what happened in Galatians were these Galatians were Gentiles who believed the message preached by the Apostle Paul, the gospel, the grace of God. There was a time where these people in Galatia knew that Paul was their apostle, their authority. But as soon as the Apostle Paul left, read Galatians 1, someone came and preached the law of Moses, circumcision, keeping the commandments, performance-based acceptance, and they had fallen from grace. We're going to see that in chapter 5. And Paul writes the letter to say, hey, it's grace. It's God's grace that's operating today. Well, Paul, in chapter 4, look at verse 30. In chapter 4, verse 30 of Galatians, where we left off, Paul uses Sarah and Isaac as a type of grace. He uses Hagar and Ishmael as a type of the law. And if you, you remember in Genesis chapter 21, Sarah gets Isaac, this child that she was long awaiting from God. But because they had already had this other child, you know, through Hagar named Ishmael, Isaac, when he got older, and Ishmael, like brothers do, Ishmael, the older brother, persecuted and he mocked Isaac. And what we saw, Paul says, it's the way the law mocks you as a grace believer. It persecutes you. It says, sinner, it makes fun of you. That's why. The law is not for us today. God deals with you as a believer by his grace, by the message that he's given through the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 30, Galatians 4, verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. I mean, that's clear. Abraham's heir was not Ishmael through Hagar. Abraham's heir was Isaac through his wife Sarah. God made it clear. By the way, it says, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Well, if you go back, and we saw it in Genesis 1, guess who said cast out the bondwoman and her son? That was Sarah. You go read Genesis 21, verse 9. It says Sarah asked Abraham, or told Abraham, the same woman who told him or asked him to you know, procreate with, with her handmaid, Hagar, is not, his wife, Sarah, is now asking him to fix the problem. See, Abraham is the spiritual head. The man is the spiritual head. And Abraham did what Adam did, hearkening unto the, you read Genesis 3, and Adam's sin was hearkening unto the voice of his wife above the voice of God. Not that you don't listen to his wife. God wants us to listen to our wives. But if it goes against the word of God, the man as the spiritual head ought to do what God told him to do. Well, Abraham listened to his wife, and now he has this other boy, the one who's not the promised seed. And my friend, what you see over in the Middle East today is a direct result of Abraham's disobedience. The son of Abraham, Ishmael, and the son of Abraham, Isaac, their seed are fighting to this day over that inheritance, the land of Israel. See, sin works all the way through. Adam's sin brings sin and death on the whole uh, creation, the whole humanity. And what Abraham did all those years ago still happened today. It affects today, doesn't it? It matters to obey God. Well, it says in verse 30, what, do, what saith the scripture? Well, we see that it was really Sarah. Hmm. Genesis said Sarah said it. Paul says the scripture said. See, when God records something in his written word, even through man, it becomes scripture. Scripture is the writings, the sacred writings. God's word has authority. And when God says, Sarah said it in Genesis, God says here that it's the scripture, okay? So it was, it's, this is not a book of man. This is God's book. God chose to use men to write it down, and he records what men say. But once it's recorded in the 66 books of the Bible, it becomes scripture. And what Sarah said way back there in Genesis 21, verse 9, to her, to her husband, cast out the bondwoman, it says the scripture said it. Now, what happened? He cast them out. Type of the law. And the same way that Abraham cast out 
Hagar, the bondwoman, and her son is how you as a grace believer ought to cast out this, this trying to be righteous before God according to the law. God has fulfilled the requirement, the righteous requirement. Now, now watch this. God has fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law in everyone that trusts Christ. For Christ, Paul says in Romans 10, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Doesn't mean that God's law, it was nothing wrong with God's law. Paul says the law is good, Romans 7. In fact, we're going to see that. It was weak in our flesh. So God did something for you you couldn't do for yourself. He imputed righteousness to you. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says God had made him sin for us on Calvary's cross, his son, Jesus Christ. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When you trust Jesus Christ, my friend, Christ died to pay for your sins. But he doesn't impute that to you until you, by faith, trust him. When you believe Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day, God takes your sin and imputes it to his son's cross work. But he also takes his son's righteousness and imputes it to you. Therefore, instead of trying to perform to be righteous before God, you're righteous in his son. The Galatians knew that. They had forgotten it. And Paul writes them that even their Christian life, now that you are saved, Think about it for a second. If you could not perform the law in order to be saved, Christ had to do it for you. Do you think with this flesh that you're going to now bring forth fruit unto God in your own strength? No. Paul says in Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, trust in him on the cross, so walk ye in him. It's going to be the same apostle Paul with the same doctrine in Romans through Philemon, the same grace message that saved you, is going to produce the good works. See, my friend, in order to produce good works pleasing to God as a believer today, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, you take in the doctrine. It is God then, Paul says, in Philippians 2, which worketh in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. As you fill up your mind, renew your mind with what Paul writes in Romans through Philemon, you start to operate out of the sound doctrine and you bring forth fruits unto God. See that? The fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. That's why Paul took this serious because you're not going to produce righteousness by trying to keep a performance-based acceptance before God. It won't happen. And if you ever think, you ever catch yourself trying to do some things to perform to please God, remember, cast out the bondwoman and her son. Cast them out. You need to trust what your apostle wrote. When you find yourself wondering about how to please God, get into the books of the Apostle Paul, okay? And I'm going to show you how you can fellowship at a church that preaches and teaches, the, teaches you this to edify you, okay? Now, so cast them out. Well, once you cast them out, it'll be Christ doing the work. My friend, in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, the reason I tell you, write these verses down. Look at them on your own time. Romans 6, 14, Paul, our apostle, says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. In Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul says, you're dead to the law. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says, there's a new operating principle called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's through the grace message that produces the fruit unto God. Look at verse 31. Oh, by the way, before we leave there, when he talks about an heir, verse 30, look at verse 30 again. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman, type of the law, and her son. Performance. Get that out of here. You're a grace believer. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. You know, my friend, the two mothers and their two sons are a type of two covenants, Paul said. It's a type, a figure, a picture of God's old covenant law. Okay? And... Now remember, it has to do with the Abrahamic covenant, which came first. But God, what he did in the book of Jeremiah 31, he says, Behold, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. There were two parts at that time. God split them up because of their sin. Not according to the, to the covenant I made with their fathers when I brought them out of Egypt, the law at Mount Sinai. But go forward, I will make a new covenant. He's going to write his law, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 says, in their heart. 
He's going to cause them to walk in, their, in his ways. See, the nation of Israel, the believing remnant, in that day, in that kingdom, God is going to dwell in them and he's going to perform for them. He's going to do for them what they could not do for themselves. And then his law is going to go out into the nations. See, over there, John says they won't have to teach everyone their neighbor or teach everyone his brother, for they all know the Lord. Every member of that little flock who rules and reigns with Christ on earth in that kingdom in the future will have his law written in, in their heart. You know, God did not permit Moses to go into the promised land. Did you know that? You ever thought about that? You know why? We're gonna, let's look at that. Go, go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. It's interesting how the Bible, he puts all of this in here for you to learn from. Israel was supposed to learn from this. Uh, Paul says that the law was a schoolmaster to bring Israel to Christ. The law was to teach that nation, and we can learn as well. Paul says, consider what I say, and the Lord and in all things. When you rightly divide the word of truth, you understand you can make sense of the Bible then? Hey, the key to understanding the Bible, right division. By understanding Paul and where we fit in in, his, in the program of God, you can go back here in Deuteronomy and understand what's going on. You won't see yourself in there, and you say, ooh, this makes sense. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, and... Um, Look at verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, I'm sorry, did I say verse 4? Yep, Deuteronomy. Let me make sure. I'm sorry, go to verse 20. Verse 20. Verse 4 is good too, but look, verse 20 is what I want. There we go. Deuteronomy 4, verse 20. But the Lord hath taken you, Moses writes to Israel, and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt. In the Bible, the iron furnace, a furnace represents Egypt. To be unto him a people of what? Inheritance, as you are this day. Remember, he says, the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir. That, that word heir has to do with an inheritance. Israel was brought out of Egypt to inherit the land of Canaan, where, where God will, in Christ, will have this earthly kingdom in the future. But that land is, there too, is theirs too. You see all that fighting going on today. That, thing, that dispute won't be settled. That, those are the sons of, of Abraham through Ishmael and through Isaac. And they're fighting over that land because it's an inheritance from their father. But can I tell you something? Cast out the bondwoman. Ishmael's descendants, not theirs. It's Isaac's, it's Isaac's descendants. And eventually one day the Lord Jesus Christ will give believing Israel, because they're not all Israel that are of Israel, only those who trust Christ as their Messiah in that day. Jews today have to believe he not only a Messiah, but a Savior, and that he died for their sins. But that land is going to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That land belongs. God gave that land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel. And one day, Christ will come and give it to them, okay? So they can stop fighting if they want. That's what the Bible says. But they won't. They'll fight till the end. Well, over there in Deuteronomy, look what Moses says. What I say, verse 20? 4, verse 20. Um... But the Lord brought them out to give them an inheritance. Verse 21. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I should not go over Jordan and that I should not go into, in, unto that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Verse 22. But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but ye shall go over and possess that good land. Oh, my friend, there in Deuteronomy 4. You know, as Moses, by the way, Deuteronomy is a second giving of the law. God gave the nation of Israel the law back here. And when they came out of Egypt, there in Exodus, there in Leviticus, and they spent 40 years just in the wilderness going around in circles. Type of your life when you walk in the flesh. And when they disobeyed God, his people, they just went around the mountain, wasted 40 years. And God had to give them the law again to remind the new generation that would go over. But did you know Moses says, I couldn't go over? God says, I couldn't go over? Look at verse 21, Deuteronomy 4, 21. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I should not go over Jordan. Verse 22, but I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan. My friend, can't get into it now, but ooh, Going over Jordan 
was them going into their new inheritance, their new land. Moses couldn't go in. Hmm, wonder who Moses represents. Well, you see this? Moses represents the law, the prophets and the prophets. You understand what's happening here with God not allowing Moses to go into the new land? This old Mosaic covenant won't be a part of Israel's inheritance in the future. He's going to make a new covenant with them. So even with Moses himself, God wouldn't allow him. God was angry with him for their sakes. Isn't that beautiful? God never intended this to be the way he dealt with the nation Israel. He always intended to deal with them based on what he would do for them. He accomplished, accomplished it through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, his shed blood. The Lord says, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is my body, which is broken for you, Israel, and he's going to bring it through. And Moses won't go into the inheritance. You see that? Well, what happened? Well, in the book of Numbers, chapter 20, Moses was told by God to smite the rock. I'm sorry, not smite it. That was the first time. He smote the rock the first time. The second time he's told to speak to the rock. Now watch this, my friend. God says, the first time, smite the rock. That's a type of the first coming of Christ, first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, okay? He died. You smite the rock. Paul says that rock that followed them was Christ. So Moses was to, spite, to, fight, to uh, smite the rock. He died the first time. Moses, as the law, Paul says in Galatians 4, that he was made of a woman, made under the law, so that he might redeem them. He came to die. He took the penalty of the law for Israel and all men. He died the first advent, so he would smite it. You remember how they beat on the Lord Jesus Christ? They crucified him, right? Well, the second time, Numbers chapter 20, God told Moses to speak to it. The prophet says that they would speak to the Messiah and they would mourn. Because they will look at him whom they pierce, O believing Israel, in the future. And the moment Moses, he didn't speak to it. Read, read Numbers chapter 20. He smote the rock a second time. And God got angry. And he wouldn't allow Moses to go into the land. And when Moses says, please, Lord, let me go. He says, no, you can't. And don't ask me anymore. You can go up to the top and look at it. He let Moses look out at the land, but he wouldn't allow Moses because guess what? The type of the second coming, the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to smote him again. Oh, no. He died and he was smote by man the first time, my friend. But the second time, you, they're going to speak to him. He's the Lord of glory. And when Moses smote that rock the second time out of anger, well, he messed up the type. And God says to Moses, you're not going over there. Guess what? God says about this law, it's not going over there. Not this old Mosaic covenant. It's not going into the inheritance. I, according to Jeremiah 31, 31, will make a new covenant. I'll write my law in their hearts. Oh, my friend, the Bible is a wonderful book, even with Moses. And guess who took them into the land? Joshua, right? Well, did you know that Joshua is the same name as, you got Jesus, Joshua means Jehovah Savior. That's Hebrew. Jesus is the Greek. It's the Gre Jesus is the Greek equivalent to Joshua. So Moses doesn't take them into the land. Guess who takes them into the land? Jesus Christ. See, over here, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take Israel into the land of their inheritance. Believe in Israel. Isn't that beautiful? All's a picture there. Well, that's what Paul says. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Go back to Galatians 4 as we wind up this study. Galatians chapter 4. You cast out that bondwoman. Moses, oh, by the way, let me, let me clarify something. That was just doing Moses' uh, surgeon, surgeon, that was doing his life, okay? I want to get this clear. Oh, God loved Moses. Uh, Moses will be resurrected. Moses is going into this earthly kingdom. During his life, to keep the type, he wouldn't let him go. Moses died, but he's going to be resurrected, and he's going to live in that earthly kingdom, okay? No doubt. Moses was there on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah. Elijah, by the way, is a type of the prophets. So you have the Lord Jesus Christ, who is fulfilled in the law, 
and the prophets. You had Christ, you had Moses, you had Elijah. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. See, that's all the beautiful types. Well, Galatians chapter 4, as we come to our conclusion, look at verse 31. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. You know, my friend, God loves freedom. Paul, and we're going to see that in the next session. He's going to start off in chapter 5. Well, let's just look at it. Galatians 5. It's a wonderful passage. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. That's the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. My friend, religion is a yoke of bondage. God loves freedom. The term grace is freedom or liberty with responsibility. See, in our day, giving per people freedom means they think they have no responsibility. But that's not the way God describes freedom. God says, I'll set you free to serve. Paul in Galatians 5 verse 13 says, use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh as a believer, but by love serve one another. My friend, God has set you free from the penalty of your sin. And each day as you learn the, the books of the Apostle Paul and, write, and learn the rest of the scriptures rightly divided, he cleanses you, he renews your mind, and he sets you free from the, from the bondage of the sin. That you, of, 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 he sanctifies you daily. And one day at the rapture, the body of Christ, he's going to take us home from the presence of sin. Where we'll be in a perfect, beautiful, sinless, holy heaven with him. Can't wait for that day, can we? But until then, God has given us the letters of the Apostle Paul to sanctify us and take away the power of sin out of our life. That's how you do it. You're free, my friend, in Christ. Once you rest in the Lord Jesus Christ, once you rest in your Savior, let me ask you, has anyone ever loved you enough to ask you that if you were to die today, this moment, or a few moments from now, where will you spend eternity? Do you know for sure? See, my friend, you only have one hope. The hope of heaven, Paul says, is the cross of Christ. My friend, God wants you to go to heaven. I'll tell you that now. God loves you, and he commended his love towards you that while you're yet a sinner, right there where you sit as a sinner, if you, if you know you're a sinner, then this is the message for you. Christ died for you. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, Paul says. Well, if you're a sinner and you believe the message of the cross that Christ died for your sins, God will save you. Won't you believe that right now? Believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. And if you are a believer, or if you've just trusted the Lord, you need to be somewhere that teaches you this so you can be edified in the truth. It's not enough just to watch on television. You need to come and be a part of other believers of like precious faith. There's a place in the Twin Cities. I'm Ron Knight. Here's my number. Here's our website, unlockyourbible.com. You need, as a believer, to study the Bible dispensationally, rightly divide the word of truth. That's where we preach. Twice a week we meet. You need to be here. Well, my friend, join us for our next time in the book of Galatians when we study Galatians 5. You read that on your own time. Until then, I'm Ron Knight saying, may the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen.